Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Tina Webb, and I'm author of the book, Cultivating the Souls of Parents. I'm here with my friend Sherry, and you're going to hear her story today. Her story, which the title of it is A Mother's Plan B. And I met Sherry probably 12, 12 13, years, 13 ago. years ago when our oldest daughters played homeschool basketball together. And we've reconnected in the last two months because of her heart behind her story, which matches the heart behind this book. And that is, as parents, we deal with challenges, our own and those of our kids, that really cause us to have to go to God and learn how to just let Him come in and bring healing. And knowing that as He's partnering with us in healing, we can better partner um, with our child um, and, and see them receive the healing that they need when there are challenges that come up. So I'm glad you're with us and I'm going to just turn it over to Sherry. She's going to share really what is this about a mother's plan B. Thank you, Tina. I appreciate it. It's called um, a mother's plan B because you know how plan A for our children, we kind of have this plan of this is what it's going to be like, and then they're going to be teenagers, and then they're going to go to college, and then get married, and you know, we have this plan A, and it didn't work that way. And so for me, I've had to learn to not just be okay with plan B, but embrace it, and I think that's where things change for me, is when I learned to embrace plan B. And I think we're like on plan JKL, something <laughs> like that now, but um, that's pretty much where the name came from. Okay, and can you just give us a snippet of what happened? Sure. My youngest child, I have four kids, so it's my youngest child when she was 14, probably 14-ish, 15 maybe, we started seeing signs that she wasn't doing well. Depression. Okay. And I've never had experience with depression other than a bad day here or there. Right. Um, so trying to recognize it and then call it what it was and when I didn't really know that was kind of challenging and it, but it also was around the time her two older sisters got married four months apart Wow! so they okay. were moving out and you know they shared the upstairs three girls were upstairs and now suddenly two of them are gone so I thought it was more just around that and two weddings we were planning and just upheaval yeah but when everything got done we'd settle back down to normal and that never happened there was no normal that ever came again ever and she went downhill worse and worse and it was right around that time right after her sisters were married that um i first noticed self-harm except i didn't know what that was okay. either mm -hmm. and she lied about it when i asked okay um, because she was scared yeah. um and that just started a journey of became severe severe self-harm which then risky risky behavior yeah. okay and then alcohol okay. and then finally drugs and crime that led her that that's shortening it but that yeah. led her to be arrested thank god okay and spend a good bit of time in jail and then be released into the drug court recovery program okay. so that's been our journey and that's been a five six almost six year wow pretty intense journey. Wow. so that's where i came to this point of um about eight, eight months ago six eight months ago being ready to share my story because when we started down this path there was no one. I I didn't know anyone to talk to about this. Hmm. I didn't know a single person that ever used No drugs. support groups or anything like that. Nothing. So that, going through something like this, like mental health issues mm. and addiction is so very isolating. And that mm. was one of the biggest things I struggled with. So when I decided I want to tell my story because I'm not the last person to deal with it. There's going to be some right. other mother coming behind me that's going to be in my shoes and feel the same way. So if I can help... If I can share my story and help her, yeah, that's what I want to do. So just, we're going to go more into your story, but what do you see this becoming? Um, you talked about being able to be a voice and, and be able to connect with people who come after you mm -hmm. um, for a mother's plan B. And do you know right now, you know, what that might look like? My desire, my heart is to share, um, really in conjunction with my daughter sometimes, mm -hmm. to families, mm -hmm. to parents, and to teenagers. I would like to help parents see some of this stuff before it happens. Right. To, to recognize things yeah. I didn't recognize. 
and share my story that way with um, I'm involved in the recovery community here and okay. continue that and then public speak at different events and schools that's really what my heart wants to do and where okay. I feel led to go okay and you already are using two platforms and um, why don't you just share with everyone where they can find you Facebook and YouTube yes um, Facebook is a mother's plan B um, it's a mother's journey through addiction and recovery and same thing on YouTube and we will share a link Okay, so great. Like that'd be excellent. That'd be excellent. Mm -hmm. So, getting into just that this point, um, I do want to ask you. You said she was about fourteen, and her sisters were getting married mm -hmm. four months apart. Did you ever notice anything in her as a little girl, or looking back? That's a, that's okay. a key. So, no, I didn't notice anything like addictive behaviors when she was young. But I always did know she was different than my other kids. She felt things on a level nobody else did. She re responded and related on a level that no one else did. So I always knew there was something different and special about her. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea about addiction or the, or to say, hmm, that's going to lead to addiction. Never. Right. Never. Okay. All right. So she's got her story and it's a testimony um, that God is doing in her in her life. But I really want to focus on you as a parent because like you said sometimes something comes up that we didn't expect mm -hmm. we're you know thrown for a curveball and um and it's 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 hard it can be isolating as sherry said we're embarrassed we might not have a community who's there for us to go to and so um now i know your faith informs you and so we'll start there in terms of just your relationship with God and, and how that helped you really even in the beginning when everything mm -hmm. was shocking. First of all, I don't know how you make it through this stuff without a faith in God. I know that was when everything was so terrifying, when horrible stuff happened, that relationship there, I always had that to fall back on. When I had nothing else and I had no clue what I was doing or where I was going, mm -hmm. that was that was my grounding. That was my foundation. So I could fall back on that. And the more you trust, mm -hmm. the more God proves himself worthy of that trust. Yeah. yeah. And so I have just learned that it can feel like hell and it can mm -hmm. hurt and you don't know how you're going to make it through, but I know I will because I've made it through yeah. before and he's going to be there with me mm -hmm. for the next thing. We always talk about, I've always worried the next shoe that drops. And there's will be another yeah. shoe that drops. Yeah. But we'll make that through make it through that too because that's what I rely on is my faith in Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. that's where my strength comes from. Yeah. Now I'm gonna I, I sent her some questions ahead of time, but I'm gonna throw you one. But I, I know okay. you can answer it. <laughs> Early on, you know, you talk about your relationship with God through Jesus Christ and how that will he was your go to. Mm -hmm. But did you ever get mad at him? Mm -hmm. Did you ever blame him? Had, or or maybe not. I d no, I didn't get mad and I didn't blame, but I felt like, why would you take me through something that I am so ill-equipped to go through this? Mm -hmm. I, th these are subjects I have no understanding or clue about. They've never been in my world before. Yeah. So why would you take me through something that I'm not equipped for? Yeah. Forgetting in those moments that he will equip me and yeah. I, I can That's do it. Great. So I would say more that. And then the, I did have some times of why. Yeah. Why? Not why me, just why. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've had to go through that too. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more question and then we're going to take a little break and come back. But... Um, Let's see. Um, did you ever feel guilty? Yes. Yes, my husband and I both have talked about this. Um, there were times that I didn't, and then other times it was just the guilt and the shame would slam me down. I felt guilty because I was unable to stop the freight train coming down the road. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I had, I mean, this is while well, she was still a minor, so before she's 18... Yet, yeah, pretty much they're an adult, and you can recommend, suggest, guide, direct, and they're going to do what they're going to do. And, mm -hmm. and feeling guilt that I couldn't stop it. Wow. Yeah. And then guilt as it 
progressed further and she got into the most awful places that I, I couldn't even protect my daughter from herself. That's one of the things her dad struggled with the most. Wow. Because that's what a dad does. That is what and a dad does. And you can't does. protect somebody that doesn't want to be protected. That's a deep statement. You cannot protect someone from themselves. No matter how much we love them and, and, right. and how much they've had an experience. I mean, this is a wonderful home. I've known you guys. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful parents. Yet, you couldn't protect her from herself. I couldn't. And that guilt and feeling of, of that, that's pretty hard to accept. Mm -hmm. And then the guilt, too, that I think every one of us as parents would look back and raising our kids and there would be a few things we would do differently. Mm -hmm. But overall, I didn't feel like, oh, we did a horrible job raising our sure, kids. I didn't right. feel that way. But I would look back, it's like, I wish this, I wish that, mm -hmm. or, you know, a a church group we were a part of that there was a lot of damage done there and yeah. if we just left sooner and so there's guilt with stuff like that but you cannot go back and change the yeah. past yeah yeah regret is a big thing I mean all of us deal with regret mm -hmm. God's had to teach me how to really let go of regret because it'll continue to pull you oh, down yeah. so it makes you ineffectual yeah. then yeah. even when that is in the past and you're moving forward if you live with regret regret you're just yeah, you're floundering. Yeah, and you're looking so much backwards, mm -hmm. you can't even see what's in, ahead of you and right. what God has ahead of right. you. So that's we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna come back. So. Okay, hey, welcome back. I'm here again with my friend Sherry, and we're gonna just continue this conversation, part two of this conversation, where she's sharing her testimony, A Mother's Plan B, about her experience with her daughter, walking with her daughter mm -hmm. through recovery yeah. and addiction. So I want to start, we, we talked about regret, we talked about guilt, and how, you know, regret something that can hold you back and keep you from looking forward. Well, in the same vein, I want to ask this question. How do you manage not being afraid that she's going to fall back into addiction? Mm. That's a great question because it's a it's a for real thing, a real feeling. And early in her recovery, maybe four or five months in, she did relapse. Okay. And it devastated me. What I didn't understand, no one had told me then, is relapse is a part of recovery. Okay. Almost to expect it. Like, don't be devastated when it happens. I was devastated. So since then, learning that that's what addicts do as they're trying to get clean and, and live clean, they relapse. Almost without fail, they do. Mm -hmm. So understanding that really helped me. And then the other thing is I've learned so much about what is and is not mine to control. Wow. Yeah. And that no matter the circumstances, if she uses that's on her and it's her, her choice okay so letting go oh a phrase that i learned was that for me fits me or hits me better than yeah. letting go is detaching with love wow okay. and that's what i do detaching with love and that is giving her the dignity and the honor to make mm -hmm. her own decisions and know that those are hers to make and the consequences that come with those will be hers also mm -hmm. so that's been very helpful for me and then, like I mentioned before, is I know God loves her far more than I ever could. And so trusting her with him. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much how I deal with the, the worry or the fear of relapse. It's actually a real fear. I mean, because mm -hmm. most addicts do. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping her early on is already <laughs> is done and under her belt. Um, mm -hmm. But mostly I, I just don't let myself go there because it's counterproductive. Sure. Okay. So. And um, in terms of detaching with love that's how you put it mm -hmm. I love that um, would you say it's kind of like setting boundaries mm -hmm. emotional boundaries where she ends and you begin Absolutely. so not to get kind of codependent and her over reliant on you yes very okay. much so mm -hmm. and being able to voice my opinions or my concerns especially if she's asking for those okay and then laying those down and then stepping back and just letting it go right there so it's okay. all about it's all about boundaries. Sure. Yeah. Is that easier now that she's an adult versus when she was yes. a child? Yes, because when she was a minor, a teen, but still a minor, there's this line of she's a minor and I need to be a responsible parent. 
but I can't make her. And when she's not wanting to be parented, yes. how do you walk? That was, those were the worst times of figuring out boundaries yeah. and parenting. So um, now it is easier now and knowing that she is an adult, it's her decision, it's yeah. on her. Yeah. And I just feel like it's so much more respectful of her for me to give her the dignity to make right. those decisions. Yeah. And, and she knows those are hers. I mine. love how you said that it gives her dignity because, you know, there's... A parent always wants to help their kid, mm -hmm. and even when they pass that legal age of 21, we still want to help them. But if we don't release them right. into adulthood, they're not going to own it. They're not mm -hmm. going to have the, um, the um, just be able to make that decision to own right. their own life choices, That's really. Right. Releasing them. And not rescuing them mm -hmm. from consequences of their own choices. Okay. So that's, and, and I mean, that goes for addiction or, you know, if you're always funding your co child's <laughs> gas tank, you right? know? Right, yeah. That's not yeah. Yeah. teaching them to be an, an independent adult. Absolutely. So. That's great. I love that. Okay, so let's, um, we talked earlier about faith mm -hmm. and your relationship with the Lord. Are there any scriptures that you really... Held on to yes. and still hold on to? Or? Yes, I wrote a few of them down. Um, one of my go-tos is Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, mm -hmm. 11. Yes, I know okay. the thoughts I yes. have for you. Yes, that one. Um, plans to give you a future um, and a hope. So that one has always been one. And then another one was Psalms 46, 1. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. Wow. I'm, I'm into... Mm -hmm. I'm a very simple person, actually. <laughs> <laughs> very practical and the simple, short verses that are just clear-cut are just, I don't know, they're my go-to. Another one um, that helped me a lot when I would be, why, 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 is Matthew 5, 3, and 4. Because I always felt like in comparison with other family members or church friends that, why is it our family that keeps having to go through this stuff? What mm -hmm. is the deal? Mm -hmm. And this verse is, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. And it hmm. says more than that, but actually I wrote it, I wrote it down right here. You're hmm. blessed when you're at the end of your rope with less of you. There is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. Wow. Those, That's a beautiful scripture. It, that it's like, okay, so there's actually meaning in all of this horror and grief and there's actually he said, I'm blessed when I'm at the end of my rope. So there's mm -hmm. good and there's beauty mm -hmm. in this ugly. And that wow. always helped me with, okay, I don't know what the good's going to be. Right. But he said it is. So yeah. I can be okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you send me those scriptures? I would love to put them in the notes. Sure. Okay. And the version that you took them from because okay. that was beautiful. Okay. Um, so as we wind up a little bit, I want to just ask, and you've shared a little bit about this too, but what have you learned about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I've learned some embarrassing things about myself, <laughs> but I will tell you, I would never wish this on my daughter or anyone, mm -hmm. but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to go through this with her because mm -hmm. it has changed me. Wow. And I will forever be grateful for that. I have learned a lot about myself in that I've learned how um, judgmental I was. Didn't know it. Kind of narrow-minded. Um, I wrote some of this down too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I learned a lot about my own character defects, things that maybe you don't have to deal with. Like they don't come up in your face all the time. So it wasn't something that I realized. Sure. But learning about my narrow view or being judgmental. And it was so easy for me to think of the drug, drug addict as some nasty help, homeless bum under a bridge. And then addiction happened in my living room, and it just turned my world upside down. And then since then, being in the recovery community in our town and just learning so much more about it, oh my goodness, hmm. addiction hits anybody, yeah, anywhere. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, caused me to rethink my view on things, too. Hmm. Um, I learned a lot about letting go, detaching okay. with love, what's mine to control and what isn't, what is... Um, what I can fix and what I can't. Yeah. That's a big one. And I would say another one is I've learned to be comfortable sitting in the ugly. Hmm. 
and I've learned to step into the puddle with other people. Things don't scare me that used to. Okay. When you've been through it um, and somebody else needs to talk or share something, I'm not like, oh, I'm afraid of your ugly. I'm sure. not. Oh, wow. I'm not afraid of somebody else's yeah. ugly. And it's it's equipped me to be able to be there for other people that in the mm-hmm. past I don't think I could have been. Wow. It's given me opportunities I've never had before. Wow. That's, um, I just almost had to pause when you said that. Um, I was reading something earlier today. Um, it was actually a book that my 10 year old was reading and it talks and it talks about just that in terms of we have to be able to get inconvenienced and go into someone's, um, I can't remember how it talked about it in the book, but kind of like someone's ugliness and be there with Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we think about, you know, especially as Christians being there for one another, you know, no Christian has a perfect life. And, but even when we talk about outside of the Christian faith, just anyone, how do we show love? How did Jesus show love? How did the good Samaritan show love? They went outside of their comfort, comfortable place and extended themselves Mm -hmm. into someone's ugly. Being uncomfortable, being okay with being uncomfortable. Being okay with being uncomfortable. I also learned a good bit about, the difference between loving and supporting versus condoning. Mm. Because I think I had mixed messages on, well, if I show you my love and approval, then you're going to think I'm okay with what you're doing. And oh. I'm not okay with what you're doing, so I can't show you my love. Oh, my goodness. We came from a place of that. So having to learn how I can love unconditionally and support however, mm. where I can, and yet you know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm not okay with what you're doing. You know, yeah. learning that was that was a big transformation in myself. I'm going to ask you to write some stuff down for me. <laughs> I know you have your notes, and that is a big deal. It was, it's a big deal. Because and I it, think that traps a lot of us. It does. Yeah. It does, especially <clears throat> if you come from a <clears throat> fairly conservative or strict religious upbringing. Mm-hmm. That's the message of if you're doing something wrong, you're engaging in an activity or sin that we all know is sin and not good. I can't love you while you're doing that because that's wrong and that means I'm okay with what you're... And that's not true. That is not true. It is not true. And how how can I reach someone and be a part of their lives and have any impact in their life if I'm sitting back here on my righteous high horse yeah. judging Yeah. And that's not right. showing them love at a time that they may need it the most. That's so right. So that's been mm. another thing I learned about myself. That I did that. Mm. That's where I came from. That's what I did. You're a brave woman. <laughs> you're, you're sitting talking about the things that you found out about yourself that you didn't see, you know, kind of weaknesses or whatever. Mm. I'm sitting here next to a strong <laughs> woman <sighs> because you're... you're Getting to another side, and even though you know, sure, there could be a relapse, you're not done yet. Mm-mm. And you're still, you know, swinging whatever you mm-hmm. have to swing. You know, you right. still have vision. Yes. Yeah. And the the thing is, I know, I did learn also that I am stronger than I thought I was. Hmm. And I'm braver than I thought I hmm. was. But it's not something you just like, oh, I'm brave. I can do this. Yes. It, it comes from a deeper place, mm-hmm. and and it's not something that comes from me. It's a it's a well I have to draw on. That's yes. And the beauty of that is Praise you God. have it too. Yes. We all have it. <laughs> yes, a well we have to draw on. Yeah. And I just yeah we're gonna. I think that's a perfect ending for what we've talked about. Um, the well is Jesus. The well mm-hmm. is faith. The well is knowing that there is a God who has a future and a hope. Um, as was referenced in one of the scriptures, it is knowing that as parents, you know, we, it's hard when things get hard and we don't have people to go to. And ideally we wish we could be in heaven right now, (laughs) but all of us were born and born into a war zone and life happens and, you know, it can be very unexpected. And I think I appreciate what you're doing because I think what I see God ushering you into is um, developing some sort of platform or or whatever it's going to look like so that there 
aren't people who have to be alone. Yes. And, yes. you know, you've gone through it and, and you can reach your mm-hmm. hand now because, there, like you said, there are going to be other people. Oh, and I think people. your faith and, you know, whether the people who come to you have faith or not, right. but you're still going to be drawing mm-hmm. on that well mm-hmm. of your relationship with the Lord even mm-hmm. as you extend your hand to other people. Right. Yeah. And that's that's my prayer is to help the next person coming behind me and there is so much shame involved with addiction mm-hmm. for for the addict and for the family members it's a it's a hush hush no no yeah. it's easier for people to talk about alcoholism than it is drug abuse cuz yeah. alcohol's legal and accepted sure drug drug abuse and even mental health issues is kind of a hush hush shame right. there's so much shame involved yeah and yet there shouldn't be we should be able to talk about yeah. that and so one of the things i think to about myself that's helped me is naming things calling it what it is i was judgmental Mm -hmm. and when i if my daughter can call herself an addict then i can call myself what i was what i was struggling with and when i can say it when i say that i i struggled with being judgmental though i didn't know it now i know what to work on now i know it has a name yeah and so learning to say the truth about me and what i've struggled with and where i where i blundered and where i've grown is so helpful for me in my healing yeah wow and you're healing, and it's ongoing. Oh yes, yeah. always it's it ongoing. is. Mm-hmm. We had a, we had in our little break, we just you know exchanged just a few a few thoughts, and because um, like I said, you know we we had kind of our our lives had gone in different yeah. trajectories as mm-hmm. I had more children yeah. <laughs> and her children, they're empty nesters now, but just um, just to chat as friends as old friends and. Um, so you're still healing and I can mm-hmm. see it in her eyes and my heart is with you. Mm-hmm. And, um, so thanks. You're thanks welcome. for sharing thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm going to ask Sherry to, I see she has a lot of her notes and some of what I want to share is video and some of what I share is, um, just going to be through articles. And so, I would love to hear from you, and I'm sure Sherry would too. If you hear this video, if you have a question or if you have a comment, please feel free to post it below. And, you know, others might say, oh, someone has the same question as I do. But, you know, let's let's just be a larger, even online community, and we can begin there. I'm going to leave uh, a Mother's Plan B information with you as well. So thanks for tuning in and God bless.